Hi everybody, uh, Josh here, broadcasting from the home office. I want to share some thoughts about maybe the most anticlimactic denouement of one of the books of the Chumash, namely Parshat Vayakal Kude, which seems to just sum up a whole bunch of details about the Mishkan, about the uh, tabernacle. Why is the Torah so insistent on making sure we pay attention to these details for a structure that is long gone? I think that's something a lot of people who hear the Torah reading think to themselves, but maybe don't admit, but it's a safe space. You can admit it. What's going on with the Mishkan? That's what we're going to explore. This is the Devar Torah called Homemaking. The book of Exodus is a funny one. It begins with an existential struggle of a people sunk in servitude, struggling for liberation, and launched into freedom. Their extrication from slavery is accomplished through divine intervention as nature is upended, the powerful are humbled, and a path is made through the sea. Independence is then concretized as a people that has been told what to do their entire lives receives a law that is theirs, a binding contract in which they are now equal members of a covenant with the Most High. And then, save a moment of conflict dramatized in last week's Parsha, the balance of the Book of Shemot is just that, a laundry list of building instructions, materials, wardrobe needed to make the Mishkan Municipal Center. Many students of Torah are left wondering what it is they are supposed to draw from the dry and detailed description of this structure long gone. Indeed, this is a challenge faced by many who look to a text as historical as the Torah for timeless wisdom. So much attention is paid to a version of Judaism to which we no longer have access. How is one supposed to relate to its arcane and even baffling details? The Torah commentary of Rabbi Nubachya ben Asher is a prime example of the Jewish exegetical mode named pardes, which is a four-level approach in which pshat, the plain meaning, remez, moral allegory, drash, midrash, and sod, kabbalistic, mystical meaning are drawn on to present a full and complex account of the Torah's meaning. Beginning with Pshat, as he methodically does, and commenting on the first verse of our second Parsha, Pekude, Rabbi Nubachya writes, according to the plain meaning, there are, these are the records of the tabernacle, refers to what was mentioned above, with Moses assigning the work of the tabernacle to the Levites. In other words, a simple contextual relation to this verse, to the last Parsha, and really to the majority of the second half of Exodus, is just what it seems. A description of the religious and juridical center of our ancestors. Vizehu, that's it. But our commentator isn't done. He is not satisfied to locate Torah's meaning merely in history, in a past long gone. So, after availing himself of Pshat, Rabbi Nubachya moves on to Drash. He writes, But according to Midrash, these are the records of the Mishkan, the Mishkan of the agreement drawn up by Moses, da 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 Why does Mishkan show up twice in this verse? A classic rabbinic question. What is it teaching us? Nothing is ever really extra in the Torah. This seemingly double doubling of the word teaches that there is a temple below and a temple above. Mishkan and Mishkan. As it was said, a place, machon, for you to dwell, you have made. Machon l'shivtacha pa'alta Hashem. The word for place, machon, or institution, is then reinterpreted by the rabbis as michuvan, with the same letters, which means intended, like the word kavana. That is, it's a reflection of the palace in heaven above. So, the meaning of the tabernacle was not just in its components, in its physical makeup and supplies, but rather was a sign that pointed to a reality beyond its time and context. The Mishkan, like the Torah, was given and assembled in history, but is not contained by it. Rabbeinu Bachya continues with the Midrash that sees the Mishkan not only as a reflection of the heavenly temple above, but also as a reiteration of the work of creation. The term used for the tabernacle's curtains is the same used to describe God stretching the heavens across the sky. Its menorah stands as a present remanifestation of the creation of the heavenly lights, the Me'orot. 
So here again, we see that the Mishkan was not a one-off occurrence, but was rather a recurrence of a process begun in the very first moments of creation. This is all to say that the Mishkan was not in truth a mere building. It was not an edifice. Rather, it was an event, one that began in the origins of the universe and recurred after the giving of the Torah. So where does that leave us in our post-Mishkan world? The sixth chapter of Tikkunei Zohar, a collection of 70 mystical drushas appended to the, to the book of the Zohar, grapples with this very problem. Where are we left now that the temple is gone? We are left in exile, and the Shechina is lost along with us. So it says, refusing to give into mere history. Happy is the one who prepares a beautiful dwelling place for God in their heart, making their limbs elegant instruments. That is, while we no longer have the Mishkan with its majestic structure, gleaming features, and splendid garments, while we have been prevented from meeting in person in our own Mishkan, in our own synagogue, we are not prevented from bringing God's presence into our lives. We turn our attention inward and make our hearts a, mish a mikdash ma'at, a small sanctuary. We transform our very bodies into holy tools, ready to be used to make this whole world fit for God's habitation. So, in truth, this double Parsha comes just when we need it to, as Passover approaches, ah! and we turn our attention to preparing our homes for the holiday. We vacuum, and we sweep, and we dust, and we scrub, all to transform our, whole, our homes into fit spaces for the holiday that celebrates our freedom. Perhaps it's ironic or even paradoxical that the holiday of our liberation requires so much drudgery. But we learn something essential as we work over every inch of our living spaces. We gain a chance to think over this year and its challenges, our lives and aspirations. Especially this year, when many of us have spent more time in our respective homes than we ever anticipated we would. We have the chance to take up our agency and intention once more, from Machon to Mechuvan. What kind of home do I want to make, we can ask ourselves. How am I creating a space in which I live, and into which I can invite the divine to dwell? We read the detailed instructions on how our ancestors set up the Mishkan to learn how we can apply that same holy labor to ourselves, to our homes, and to our lives. Chazak, chazak, v'nit chazek. Shabbat shalom.